We're glad to have you back. Now, one of the most notable reforms of President Tinumbu's removal of fuel subsidy, which has resulted in sharp increases in the price of fuel. This move was also accompanied with the unification of the foreign exchange market, leading to a high exchange rate and causing inflation. Experts say while the reforms may be a long-term benefit or may have long-term benefits, it's essential to address the immediate challenges faced by our citizens to mitigate the burden of these reforms on lives. And, of course, uh, we've been uh, hearing a lot of discussions uh, around this government stating what's been happening. Uh, I have uh, Mr. Viola Kwaga. Uh, he is the head of Open Government and Institutional Partnerships uh, Organization, but it's foundation. Uh, it's good to see you this afternoon. Thank you uh, for joining the program. Delighted, as always, to be here, Tolu. <laughs> well, I think we should start with the fallout uh, of the protest. For example, let's look at what happened in Kano State, uh, where the Nigerian Communications Commission's facility uh, uh, was attacked. And look at what happened there, vandalized and all of that. Uh, what do you make of those kind of um, negatives that come out of incidents or events like that? And what it means for the economy. Yeah, I mean, for, for one, there's always the thought about the extent of impact on the economy and how the protests, though well intentioned for many quarters, uh, will slow down economic activity. And for a country like Nigeria, in our particular phase of you know economic development, it will mean that uh, businesses that are that are, you know, day-to-day -day businesses, uh, fast-moving consumer goods, for instance, and light manufacturing, farming, uh, well, maybe not so much farming, but light manufacturing, and also transport and logistics, you know, would suffer adversely due to the impact of the of the protests. And, you know, not to talk of the vandalization, but the, the damage, of course, to government property is, is unfortunate. But, you know, surely uh, the government would ensure a lot of its uh, equipment and its facilities. So at least the government can take care of itself to some extent. This is not to say that the damage is good. It's just to say that compared to uh, the private sector, you know, that may not have adequate insurance covers, you know, for uh, riots and violence that, you know, results uh, due to protests, it's going to be very difficult for the private sector to really bounce back. Uh, it's uh, it's claimed, you know, I think it was uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf that uh, believes that Nigeria may have lost uh, an upwards of 400 billion naira due to the several days of the protests. Uh, it would be interesting to uh, know how he arrived at that figure. I mean, I think the Minister for Trade as well uh, suggested that Nigeria may have lost as much as 500 um, billion naira due to the protests. Of course, it would be interesting to know how she arrived at that figure. But one thing is certain, due to the due to the slowdown in economic economic activity, it will mean that there will be adverse effects, you know, due to uh, the protests. Uh, hopefully, uh, the protesters, you know, would uh, have begun to uh, wind down. Even though there are rumors that uh, there's supposed to be a million person march, I think sometime today or tomorrow. Uh, but hopefully, uh, the government and the protesters would be able to find uh, some some midpoints, you know, to uh, to actually have talks and really end, uh, end the protest. Mm. Truly, you agree with me that a lot of money is involved in this. 500 billion somewhere, 400 billion from uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf. I know SPM professionals, um, Mr. Paul Alaje came up with about 350 to also 400 billion, and the ministry is already reporting 500 billion. Of course, there is an amount that we have to pay for incidents like this. And that takes me to my next question, uh, looking at the oil and gas industry, which is very strategic. We all talk about funds and how we generate revenue from this important segment of the economy. But my question to you is, we've had this back and forth. Many believe that, yes, Dangote refinery coming on stream, uh, that could have been the uh, solution to all of the problems in that sector following the implementation of the PIA. But the back and forth we have now, crude oil not getting to the site, we don't have enough crude oil, we're not getting enough supply from the NNPC. This is this back and forth. What does this mean even for investments in your thoughts? I mean, for one, it is a very unfortunate signal that Nigeria is unable to handle its affairs in a neat, smooth, and efficient manner. Uh, the, the situation has become so dire that the National Assembly 
uh, through the through its leadership, yeah. has initiated a committee to look into uh, the challenges, you know, uh, concerning the NNPC and the supply contracts and the Dangote uh, refinery. So this is a signal to the international community, which, by the way, has been withdrawing relatively significantly in terms of the extent of investment. So analysts, you know, are of the view that Nigeria has been receiving less and less investment in our oil sector in particular. I mean, quite recently, <clears throat> the federal government did announce, uh, I think, a final investment decision uh, between Shell, I recall, and uh, the NNPCL worth about uh, $50 million, if I'm not mistaken. And, I mean, that is interesting. But compared to the, the, the rate of investment that we are used to, I think is a far cry from what you know has hap had happened in the past. I mean, you could say that this is as a result of a global shift towards you know cleaner fuels uh, generally. But Nigeria at this moment, at this point in our economic development, still do we still do need to exploit you know these uh, resources, uh, albeit in a very responsible manner. Uh, the federal government, you know, at least Tinubu has tried to make some very decisive moves as regards managing the sector, uh, and I refer to the exemption order for oil and gas companies or tax incentives, uh, the presidential, the two presidential directives on local content compliance and reduction in petroleum sector contracting costs and timelines. So this shows that there is an intention by the administration at least to, to make things work faster and better, but uh, public policy has less to do with intention and more to do with actual implementation. The management of the NNPC does need to understand that there is a, an entire market, you know, globally that is willing to buy its crude oil, willing to buy Nigeria's crude oil. And wherever that comes from, it will be paid for. But there has to be an understanding as to the priority given to domestic uh, pr producers and the national interest involved. So it is not only a production uh, decision or a production conversation, it's also a sovereignty and economic, national economic development question. And hopefully the National Assembly will you know, do the right thing, be diligent and be committed and ensure that infractions when they are uncovered will lead to punishments and will lead to consequences for this bad behavior. It, it amounts to sabotaging the economy. Several people you know, hold the view that the debacle is a reflection of a lack of consequences. Uh, we, we, we urge the president to, or rather we urge the National Assembly to expedite this process, you know, ensure that everyone is made to give proper account and Nigerians are carried along because the oil and gas sector generally is not as transparent as, you know, it should be, you know, despite several uh, moves by several organizations in the past, you know, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative to really bring some transparency to, uh, to the oil sector. So, you know, by and large, uh, Nigerians want to see results. Nigerians want to see an improvement. Nigerians want to see us going way above the uh, 1.46 or so, which includes condensates production uh, capacity, production outputs. Let's, let, let's even try to exceed the OPEC quota and get back to the 1.8, 1.9, 2 uh, billion barrels, you know, that we're used to, to shore up at least more Forex in the medium term. Mm. That's a big one. And there the issue of all theft comes in that is actually eating up that industry uh, very badly. But let's talk, touch on palliatives because our, our conversation is getting so smooth that we are almost moving away from that. Now, specifically, we see that disconnect. The price of fuel went up, affected transportation, movement of food across the country. And there's obviously a hike. Government is talking CNG, which obviously is cheaper to run vehicles. What other uh, human-faced uh, approach do you expect from government now? Or what sort of initiatives are you thinking of? Because for me, impact is very important so that everyone has a feel of whatever government is doing. What is running through your mind? We've seen things for um, initiatives focused on youth, the uh, student loan thing, credit core. We've seen graduates that don't have jobs now confirming that they are getting a lot. What more do you think government needs to do that will be focused on getting the people and, of course, making them inclusive in all of the decisions of government? 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I think this, this question could possibly occupy our entire interview. The, the problems with productivity in Nigeria are to a very large extent structural. And that means that these are issues, these are features of the economy that are, are a result of several decisions, political and economic, taken years in the past. So yes, the federal government through the Ministry of Youth Affairs you know, has come up with a raft of initiatives meant to provide finance to, 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 to young people, which is interesting. And you know, that answers you know, the question of economic development and managing your economy. Are you making credit available for entrepreneurs? You know, if you think of uh, an economy you know, with, with the four major factors, land, labor, uh, capital, and entrepreneurship, at least the government is trying in quotes to answer that question. But when we look at where that leads to, what types of businesses are these young people into? Are they enough to move the needle in terms of gross domestic product? Are they enough to move income levels to higher, to higher points you know, than Nigeria has seen? You know, in, in, in addition to you know, this problem of insufficient capital, there are also, there's, there's also the question of land management. And I think this is a, maybe not really addressed as much as it should, but the president does need to have conversations with the governors, because as we know, in quotes, the federal government doesn't own any land. State governors are, hold this land in trust on behalf of their states. And economic activity cannot happen where land tenure systems, where land allocation systems, where land management generally is you know, inefficient and is very challenging from a bureaucratic perspective. What is the average time it takes to get a C of O, for instance, in any Nigerian state? And if you're hearing three, four, five months to get a C of O, you know, that will have negative effects on doing business. And these are, you know, these are very critical aspects of you know, ramping up the structural problems in Nigeria. And even looking at labor, the productivity of labor, what is the quality of you know, manpower? What is the level of skill? What is the level of capacity? So state governors, we really need to shine the light on state governors this time for this land, uh, at least for the land question, and even for the productivity question, because productivity entails not just human skill, but also technological capacity. And how are entrepreneurs being, you know, how, are, how, how is this technological capacity being developed, whether it be in agriculture, whether it be in light manufacturing, whether it be in heavy manufacturing, you know, which Nigeria does not see enough of. What are the what what is the arrangement for the acquisition of equipment, you know, high level heavy duty equipment, you know, that can provide uh, or, or heavy duty equipment that you know can provide a strong manufacturing base for the country that will really show an improvement in GDP numbers. So it's more than just providing funds for the youth. There are, there are fundamental questions that need to be asked about the nature of economic activity about the quality of skill, about the role of technology and access to that technology, about you know, the nature and quality of the logistical arrangement in the country. You, know, you have uh, hundreds and thousands of kilometers of roads, many of which are in states and in local governments. And how well are states attacking the problem of ensuring that there, there, is high, there are high quality paved roads in their states, which will enhance you know, agriculture, which will enhance trade and enhance logistics. So it's, it's really more than just providing uh, funds. I, I see that as a very simplistic approach to the problem. And, you know, these are still, like I said, structural problems, even from a political perspective, because the, the pressure that needs to go to governors really is not there. Uh, you know, the state houses of assembly that should act as oversight mechanisms, you know, on the activities of the state executives is really missing from Nigeria's political discourse because we have, you know, challenges in the relationship between state houses of assembly and uh, and, and governors. You know, to in in some respects, you know, some people have claimed that their relationship is not a check and balance relationship, but the legislatures are merely extensions of the state governors, and that that type of politics cannot create the prosperity that Nigeria needs to see. So, in summary, I will say that you know the Joint Planning Board 
needs to have very, very rigorous conversations where state governors and the president, you know, commit to a joint plan, you know, to address these structural problems in Nigeria. Viola Kwaga, Head Open Government and Institutional Partnership Organization, Budget uh, Foundation. Thank you uh, so much for being on the program this afternoon. We really appreciate this. We don't take it for granted. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Tulu.